We call it PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But what's the history of this condition? Well, the short answer is that it was first recognised and diagnosed at the time of the First World War, and the name for it was shell shock. And in a way, literature, poetry in particular, has a particularly close relationship to this history because one of the first doctors who really understood shell shock and how it should be treated was Dr W H R Rivers who ran a residential facility for wounded First World War soldiers at Craig Lockhart near Edinburgh and among the people he treated there in the latter part of the First World War were the poets Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen and Robert Graves. Sassoon and Owen indeed met and formed their great friendship at Craig Lockhart and some of their finest war poems reflect their experience there. Pat Barker's novel Regeneration, which was very successful as a novel and a film, explores this whole area. But fascinatingly, when I began work on trying to find out what was the earliest example of a war poem that was somehow reflecting the experience of shell shock, I found that it happened much earlier in the war, indeed just within a few months of the war beginning. The poet in question was called W. W. Gibson, not anybody that we read now, I'm not sure I'd even heard of him before doing this piece of research. Uh, he was a very popular poet among the group of so-called Georgian poets, writing um, in the reign of King George V in the period immediately before the First World War. He didn't join up himself but he was very interested in reading in the newspapers about the experience of soldiers on the West, Western Front. Um, and indeed, he interviewed the returning wounded soldiers, even in those first few months of the war. And so it was that in October of 1914, just a few months after the, the, the war began, he published a poem. It was published in a, a liberal newspaper, a newspaper that was probably arguing uh, uh, implicitly against the fact of the war going on. It was called The Messages, and I've got it here. It's written, to begin with, in the voice of a returning soldier. I cannot quite remember. There were five dropped dead beside me in the trench, and three whispered their dying messages to me. Back from the trenches, more dead than alive, stone deaf and dazed, and with a broken knee, he hobbled slowly, muttering vacantly, I cannot quite remember. There were five dropped dead beside me in the trench, and three whispered their dying messages to me. Their friends are waiting, wondering how they thrive, waiting a word in silence, patiently. But what they said, or who their friends may be, I cannot quite remember. There were five dropped dead beside me in the trench and three whispered their dying message to me. The returning soldier, losing his memory, partially deaf and dazed, haunted by the memory of those who dropped dead beside him in the trench. Now at that point in autumn 1914, the word shell shock wasn't available to describe that experience, but clearly that is the experience that is being described. It was a few months later in early 1915 that a captain in the Royal Army Medical Corps called Charles Myers published an article in The Lancet called A Contribution to the Study of Shell Shock, being an account of three cases of loss of memory, vision, smell and taste admitted into the Duchess of Westminster's War Hospital in Le Touquet. And a few months later there was another article in the British Medical Journal called Remarks on Cases of Nervous and Mental Shock observed in the base hospitals in France. So that's where the word shell shock comes from. I'm joined by Andrew Schumann, general practitioner and poetry lover. Um, Andrew, this account of shell shock, what we now call PTSD, involving loss of memory, but also interference to vision, smell and taste. What, what, what's going on there? What's the connection between mental trauma and the, this effect on, on the senses? I think, it's a, I think it's a loss of connection um, and between, between structures in the brain that we now know to um, function in the ordinary situation 
to uh, receive external stimuli that tell us uh, whether to flee, the fight or flight reflex. So, and the structure in question is the amygdala. The Greeks called it uh, the amygdala, which is the Greek word for almond. It's almond-shaped structure that's very deep within the brain, um, deep to the temporal lobes, just above the, the brain stem. So it's a very ancient structure. Um, and it's the, the first structure, really, that lights up when these first stimuli of, of per perceived or possible danger enter your brain, and the amygdala fires up to get you ready to flee um, or to freeze, or, or the fight or flight reflex. Now, that's the, the most ancient structure. There's another structure called the hippocampus, which is a, um, a seahorse-shaped structure that the Greeks called um, the hippocampus, which is Greek for seahorse, and that regulates the amygdala. It's, it's a bit higher up in the brain, and there's this interplay between the two that allow you to downplay the initial reaction, so you, you don't over-exaggerate your response to, to, to an external stimulus. You wake, for example, in the middle of the night, the sound of breaking glass, the amygdala will fire up, but very soon that'll be damped down, um, and then the more conscious areas of the brain will take over even further, and you realise you know, it's a bird flying through the window, it's not a, 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 a robber gaining entrance to your house. So these, these deep structures deep within the brain are... Um, firing up automatically to begin with. And the problem we think with post-traumatic stress disorder is there's a, uh, a, a problem with the communication between the two. So the, the, the almond and the seahorse are not communicating. The seahorse isn't um, damping down these, these, this over-stimulated amygdala. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then you get this uh, over-exaggerated response, these over-exaggerated neurological um, pathways being set up. And then if the disorder develops, then these pathways get set up and, and can't, the loops can't be broken. So you get this recurring image, these recurring nightmares, both nightmares by night, but also living nightmares, where the image is played over and over again, these recurring um, loops uh, of the original experience that, that can't be controlled. So this, this, this poem here seems like a, a, a marvellous account of exactly that. Because I think it's it the, is, yes. The key yes. to the poem is this, this repetition. Yeah. Uh, I cannot quite remember, but at the same time, he can't quite forget, and that, that oh, in a way absolutely. is exactly the sort of the, the tragedy, if you like, of, of, of PTSD. It's, um, it, it's you, you're, you want to forget the bad thing that's happened, yeah. but you can't. But then somehow you can't remember some of the other good things in your life. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a horrible thing, isn't it? But do, do you think there's a, a, a way that um, reading a poem that, um, that sort of crystallises that experience um, might actually be helpful to people who have maybe had a traumatic experience themselves to know I am not alone, someone else has mm. had this experience. I think it is, because a lot of uh, the, the experience of post-trauma is, is it, it creates, you become isolated, withdrawn, and it becomes something that you experience alone. And I think the more, and one of the features that can protect against is against PTSD f developing is a perceived sense of social support. So you have other people banding together, the band of brothers. Um, historically, that's perhaps where a band of brothers, for many other reasons, has, has formed, because you, you get this, this support network which can, can somehow allow you to stop this, this disorder developing. Um, but if you experience it alone, then you get this recurring... Um, and, and we end with ellipses at the end. It just goes on and on. It ha has mm. no end. Mm. So that, that's interesting, the, the idea that a sort of a, a social support group is, uh, is something that can, that can really help with PTSD. Um, Wilfred Owen was treated for what was then called shell shock that we now call PTSD at the Craig Lockhart Hospital. Um, then after he was discharged from there, um, he was in Scarborough in a, in, in a sort of um, recovery facility waiting to be redeployed back to the front where, of course, eventually he was killed. But he wrote a poem there called Mental Cases, um, where he just looks around the room at all these other um, shell, all these other soldiers who have who, been afflicted with shell shock. And he begins, who are these? Why sit they here in twilight? But there's a, there's a real sense that because he's part of a group, um, there's a, a way that the, the, the poem can, can, can help them to, 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 to begin to, to share the experience. Mm. And that perhaps can be a, a form of catharsis. I think it is the sharing. And we see that, for example, at the end of um, Owen's poem, The Disabled, but he's left alone. And I think he says at the end, why don't they come? The nurses he's referring to, why don't they come? And he's so alone. 
Um, and certainly in, in my practice, one of the biggest killers we, is, is isolation and loneliness. So nowadays, as then, it's people being isolated and lonely, not having reassurance, not having social support, not having all the backup and, and humanity and this touch. There's such an important thing about touch. Um, I think Albert Schweitzer said, man, has claim man belongs to man, man has claims on man. This thing that makes such a difference, both physical and metaphorical touch, that joins us together and has a healing quality. And that's how this feeds into that. You start linking both currently and historically with other people who experience what you've experienced and you become less alone. I think that's one of the many um, vital functions of, of any form of literature that, that joins you to others.